Okay, so uh, today you got two handouts. The first one is your assignment 201, which is your first assignment for this class. It, um, it's a pretty long stretch because you're still learning things. But I figure I'll give it to you now, and that way you can kind of be working on it in the background, though some of the skills that you may need to do what it is that you want to do, like pillows, for example, or cushions, or that sort of thing, that's coming later. So you can start with some of the basics now. Uh, you're going to be modeling and rendering a table and chair. I'm pretty loose with the definition of a table and a chair. A chair is something you can sit on. A table is something you can put something on. Beyond that, I'm pretty lenient on it. Uh, you can take it literally or you can get creative about that. That's just fine. Um, apparently, I was asleep when I made the copies. And uh, no, it is not due on Monday the 3rd of May or March. Uh, so that's wrong. The online, it does show correct. Uh, the assignment is due on Wednesday, the 2nd of October. So if you could scratch that off and correct it for you. The calendar should reflect that as well, but I always feel bad when I make uh, mistakes on the handouts. So I apologize, but it was, a, it was an oversight on my part. Um, you're going to be modeling the table and chair. You're going to be assigning appropriate materials. You're going to be performing texture mapping so that the materials are at the appropriate scale. And like if it's wood, the grain of the wood is going in the right direction, some of those kinds of things. Again, we'll talk all through that. You don't have the skills to do that just yet, but you will by the time this is done. And you will ultimately be creating three renderings and turning in those three renderings. So there'll be three views required. Um, and so we'll, we'll go through that as it gets a little bit closer, but I like to point it out. I would also like you to print your best image, whichever one that one is, uh, on an 8.5 by 11 sheet. Nothing fancy. Print it in color to one of the school printers. There's a little sheet over there that tells you what the printers are. I say on the handout the C5550, but over the summer they took that one away, and now it's the M750 something, something, something. So uh, it's the color printer over there, and my guess is you probably printed to it anyway. Uh, okay, that's pretty good. Uh, you will be commenting on the table and chairs. Not that that's a big surprise to you guys. Okay? So that's um, assignment 201 in a nutshell. Again, it's due on the 2nd of October. So we've got a couple weeks before that's going to happen. And we'll learn a lot in the process before you guys actually uh, can complete this anyway. So today, we're going to work on our exercise 206. And I'm going to pull it up here right now. There it is, 206. And we're going to be making a little spider clamp. This is something that holds. Uh, like a piece of glass. Sometimes it's, it's helpful if I bring up an image of this. So it's something like, let's see if I can find one that's, that's, that's pretty good. Something like this, where you've got a little, um, a little clamp that goes through the sheet of glass. And then it's got a little tension rod and it's got a little tension cable. Ours is not as sophisticated as one of these. It's simplified. But it's about sweeps and tubes and that kind of uh, geometry that I want you guys to, to explore today. So I'm going to work you through. I'm going to talk you through how to create it uh, so that you can you can follow along. Um, but this is ultimately the kind of thing that we'll use later on after we assign materials and after we do texture mapping to make like a big curtain wall. Uh, so we'll reuse this piece later on. So make sure you save it today as well. Okay. So I'm going to start out by working in the top view for just a second. And I'm going to draw a, a simple shape. And I can do this shape in a variety of, of manners. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is to draw the arc. I could draw the line first. Um, it's really it's, it's up to you. You guys see the shape to the side. Uh, it's a two foot radius arc, or excuse me, two inch radius arc. Uh, and so I can use the arc tool. And there's a variety of arc tools here that can be beneficial. I think this first one, the arc center start and angle, is a pretty good one. So I'm going to start with that. I know it's two inches over from the origin. So my first point is going to be 0, comma, or excuse me, 2 inches, comma, 0. That's my first point. There it is. Uh, my, I'll be coming back to 0, 0. Oh, you know what? My units are wrong. How about that? I made a mistake. Units. I didn't pick the large. You know what? I'm just going to create a new document. It's because I opened Rhino and didn't pick a template. 
it went to millimeters instead. So let me do a large object inches. There we go. And let's try this again. So I'm going to do that arc, start, uh, center, start, and angle. First one will be 0, 0,2 inches. No. 2, 0. I just, I'll warn you guys ahead of time, I have been like dyslexic all day. Like everything I try to do is like backwards and uh, it just is what it is. So let's uh, go back to the origin here, 0, 0 for the start of the arc. And then I'm going to go up at 90 degrees. This is pretty easy if I turn on my ortho because it'll just snap to 90 degrees and create that first arc. Next thing I'm going to draw is a polyline. I'll snap to the end here. Remember, by default, sometimes your snap is not turned on. I'll turn on end, uh, mid, and perpendicular as my default snaps that I tend to keep on. There we go, snap to the end. And I'm going to draw a line here at 13 inches. And then I'll go ahead and press Enter to finish. And the last thing I need is this arc again. So I could come over to the arc tool. And I could come down uh, by 0, comma, negative 2. Actually, I just have to type in 2 inches. There we go. And I could go over 2 inches there. And I could fold that back up. Alternatively, because there's always alternate ways of doing it, I could take the curve that I've already drawn. I could use the mirror command, snap to the center of this line, and draw the second half that way. Pretty easy. So we're doing an arc a line, and another arc. I'm going to take all three of those objects, and I'm going to join them to go together by going up to the Edit, and then Join. I could press Control D or type Join. Uh, I need to turn off that OpenGL because I'm missing line segments here. Let me go into my Tools, and then Options, View, OpenGL. Let's turn off that GPU. There we go. Now we can see everything. That's good. So I have that drawn. It's flat. So let me double click and jump over into the perspective view here. And so now we're seeing this in its flat orientation. I'm going to use the rotate 3D command to rotate that up so that it's standing up. So I'll go up. I have it selected. I'll go up to transform and then rotate 3D. The axis of rotation is right along the x-axis here, because I want to keep that at the bottom and then flip it to stand up. So I'll snap to the first point, snap to the second point, and then I'll pull this so that it's standing up. Make sense so far? Good deal. So I have that first bit. Now, I have a control curve. So I have a curve. But I'd like this, instead of being just a line or a curve, depending on how you want to call it, I'd like it to have some kind of dimension to it. And I can do that using something called a sweep. And this is a very powerful tool in Rhino. All I need is the cross section of the sweep. So in this case, I want it to be like a tube. I want it to be um, uh, round in cross section. So I'll use the circle tool right here. I'm going to snap right to the corner. And now here, uh, I tell you that the diameter is a half of an inch. So it's asking me for radius. So I either need to convert to radius, which would be 0.25 inches, or I can click on or type D for diameter, and then type in uh, 0.5 inches. And there it is. One of the mistakes people do when they make this object is they make the tubes too big. So we need it to be only a half an inch in diameter. There it is. So let's explore the Sweep tool. So the way the Sweep tool works is I'll go up to Surface and then Sweep One Rail. We'll get to what two rails mean in just a second. And when I choose Sweep One Rail, the first thing it's going to ask me to do is to select the rail. So this is kind of like a, a train. The train sits on its tracks. The rail is kind of like that in that it guides where the train goes. The train can't go off of that track. It's the same kind of thing. So we're going to use that. The rail would be this object. Then it says, select cross-section curves. The cross-sectional curve would be my circular object. When I'm done, I'll go ahead and press Enter. It's going to say, where do you want the seam to be? That's fine. It can be right there. Usually, the default options are just fine. I'll go ahead and press Enter. And you'll see that it will give me some options here. We're going to leave it as freeform. I'll explain road-like in just a second. 
The rest of these options are just fine, and I'll say OK. Now once I've done that, you'll see, especially if we go into shaded mode, that essentially what I have is I have like a tube instead of where that line was. So I've given some dimension to it. So it doesn't matter what your curve looks like, you can always work with a cross section. So let me come over here. I'm going to use this. This is an illustration here. I'm going to use curve interpolate points. Let me turn off my ortho for a second. And I'm going to give myself, sure, we'll end right like that, just for illustration purposes. I also want to raise up some of these. So let's take these two pieces. So let's take these three. And we'll move them vertically by some something. OK, so I have that space, the, that curve that goes in space like that. I can take any kind of a cross section. All right, let me create this here for a second. So there's a cross section there. I can use this as a rail. I can use this as my cross section. Let me rotate this a little bit better just to get started here. Yeah, about like that. And so I can t go back to my sweep. Let me go to surface, sweep one rail. Rail first, there's my rail. Cross sectional curve, there's my cross sectional curve. I'll hit Enter. That's fine for my scene. And I'll go ahead and say OK. Now in this scenario, we're in free form. And you see that as we go into these corners, it's kind of like it's banking a little bit. Okay, It's following along with the curve. I can switch to road-like top, which is going to keep it flat, more like a path would be, if you want to sweep that, or a bridge, or something like that. So depending on which option you choose, you're going to get different results. This is more like, like a curling ribbon for example, where it, it winds. Uh, and the road is where you're keeping that cross section flat. <clears throat> when you're done, you would go ahead and say OK. And that then gives you that end result there. Like I said, it doesn't matter what your cross section is. So instead of having that rectangle, I could very easily have uh, you know, drawn a circle. And let me rotate. There we go. And so there, I could use that, that circle there. And I can sweep one rail cross section. And that then builds the pipe or the snake or whatever. But you guys see how pretty much any rail that you can create, you can add some dimension to it using this. So the other thing that people assume when we start talking about that is that somehow the rail has to be adjacent to or right next to the thing that you're sweeping. It doesn't matter. I could take this piece, and I could move it away from my rail. And I could sweep one. There's my rail. There's my cross section. And it's just going to build it that distance away from my object. So this, is, you know, it's kind of messy and self-intersecting there. But you guys get the idea where you don't have to be right next to your object. You could be to the side. You could be in the middle. You could be anywhere. The rail still just guides the shape that you're creating. So the next question is, we have a sweep one rail. What about that sweep two rail? So let me make a copy of this, copy uh, in place. And then let me take this one here, and let me scale it. Maybe like that. I need to make some modifications here. OK, so I've just made a few modifications to that. Now the sweep two rail is going to use both rails together. So if I had an object that, say, went from here 
to there. Let me rotate it. Again, they don't have to actually match up. I just think it's easier to explain when they match up. I can then sweep two rails using both of these to control that one object. So I'll go back to sweep, and this time it'll be sweep two. And it's going to say select first rail, there's my first rail. Select second rail, there's my second rail. Select cross-sectional curve, there it is. I'll press enter. Seam is just fine, I'll press enter. And so now you can see that it's using both the, uh, the curves to control. So it can get narrower, it can get fatter, depending on how far apart they are. I'm going to hit cancel here for just a second, and I'm going to make two of these get closer together, just so you can see it a little bit better. Okay, so let's make, oop, too far. Let's make those two pinch together a little bit, and then we can do that sweep to rail rail, cross-sectional curve. And do you guys see how that gets much smaller when those lines get to closer together? So we've got the flexibility to control based on two sweeps, or two rails instead of just one rail. Uh, the double rail is much less common in practice, but it's worth at least pointing it out that it's part of what we're doing. OK, so all of that was just complete side notes explaining how uh, sweeps work. We're going to come back to that little object here. I'm going to select it, press Z, Enter for Zoom, followed by S, Enter for Selected. That recenters my orientation around that object. And we will ne then need to build some little inch and a half diameter buttons. These are the things that hold the glass. It's this thing. And like I said, we're doing a simplified version of this. So I'm going to go ahead and in my um, solid primitives, I'm going to come to the cylinder option. I can also type in cylinder into my command line. I'm going to snap right to the center right here to start to create this. Notice that it's in radius. I want to make sure I'm in diameter. Same thing here. This is 1.5 inches. And my depth is going to be 0.25 inches. Uh, I think I have to put negative 0.25 inches. And there we go, because I want it going down from there. Perfect. Let's do it again over on this end. So I'll zoom out and zoom in right there. Same thing. I'm going to go into my solid objects here, and I'm going to choose my cylinder. I'll snap to the center. I'll make sure diameter selected, which it is. The last distance um, at 1.5 inches was also correct, but I could type it in again. And now this is going to be negative 0.25 inches, so that's going down. So I end up with this curving piece and then two little buttons on the ends. I need a button on the other side of the glass, so I'll take this cylinder. I'm going to copy it. So I can go up to Transform and then choose Copy, or I could go to, to um, I could type in Copy. And this time, I want to make sure that I'm copying it vertically. So if I just say, oh, select base point, great. All right, well, it's copying, but it's always in the xy plane. It's not going down. So when I copy it, I want to choose vertical, and then I have control to make it just go down. So in this case, I copied from that point. I want to, the glass is going to be half inch thick, so this needs to be 0.75 inches down. Uh, sorry, negative 0.75 inches. Told you, I ha I'm having trouble today. Everything's backwards from what it needs to be. Um, and that then creates the half inch gap in between the, between the two quarter inch little buttons. I'm going to do the same thing over on this end. It's good for repetition here. We'll select it. I'll go up to Transform and then Copy. I'll select a base point. And this, oops, there, I made that mistake. It needs to be vertical. Then I'll select this as a base point and say negative 0.75 inches. And that, I'll press Enter to finish. And that gives me both sides. 
So I need to rotate this so that it um, goes diagonally here. So I've made it straight, but I need it to go over diagonally. So I'll take the whole thing. I'll go up to rotate. This is not a rotate 3D. This is just a standard rotate. I'll snap to my end point right there. And so this time, we're going to go by 45 degrees. So I'm actually going to type in 45 to cause that to rotate 45 degrees. So I have this piece made. I need to make the same piece that goes the opposite direction. And so we have some options here where I could take this. It's already made. I could copy it. So let me go to Transform and then Copy. I'll make a copy and I'll stick it over here for a second. I'll take this object here. I'll rotate it. Transform, Rotate. I'll snap to the middle. And we need to go back by 45. Uh, it's actually uh, 180. Never mind, 90. There it is. Then I can move it. I'll go to Transform and then Move. Make sure I'm snapping to the midpoint. Make sure I'm snapping to that midpoint. It's very conveniently not letting me snap to here. Oh, come on. I'm going to switch my display into ghosted mode, which should let me get it. There we go. And now I have those two pieces intersecting like that. The alternative to that, and this is again about efficiency as you learn how to create these objects in the first place. There's nothing wrong with doing it this way, but that took many more steps. If I were doing it myself, I would select the object, I would go up to transform and then choose copy, or I would type copy. I would copy in place. So I'm going to click on the in place. When I do that, the copy remains selected. I can then type rotate from the center here, 90 degrees, and I've created it. So I saved all the steps of moving and rotating. But you have to kind of know what you're doing to do that. So I like to point it out as one of the more advanced strategies for improving speed and modeling. So I've gone ahead and I've created both little bottom pieces there. The next thing that I need is the, um, the pole that extends out of this spider clamp that's going to hold the cable uh, at, the, at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and start to create that. Uh, let me double check here. Yep, OK. So in this scenario, I'm going to continue with my sweeps, though there are, much other, there are many other ways to create this. I'm going to start working right here, and I'm going to draw a line. Let me turn on my ortho here for a second. I'm going to draw a line that is, call it two feet, going in that direction. I'll go ahead and press Enter to finish. So I have a two foot line there. Next thing I'll do is I'll use my circle. I'll come down here and snap to the bottom. And I want my diameter, which it is currently in diameter, to be a half of an inch. Sorry, I'm just double checking. Yep, 0.5 inches. And there it is. I'll use Rotate 3D to rotate that up into the third dimension. So I'll go to Transform, Rotate 3D. And I'll put that up like that. Then I'll use my sweep. So I'll go up into surface, sweep one rail. There's my rail. There's my cross-sectional curve. And there is my rod. Now you guys should be saying, well, wait a minute. Couldn't we go back to the cylinder option right here and say, OK, I wanted my diameter to be 0.5. And I wanted my height to be 2 feet and create it that way? Sure, nothing wrong with that. So there's always multiple ways of creating the same object. In this scenario, it might be easier to do the, the cylinder that's just a long, skinny cylinder. It doesn't matter how you make it. It's just learning the process. So I set this up scripted because today I'm trying to emphasize sweeps. But it doesn't mean that you couldn't create it this way. So now it's time to create the little 
piece on the end. It's like a little donut. So we're going to come in here, and I'm going to start with the circle, and I'm going to create two circles. The first one, the diameter is going to be 3 eighths of an inch, 0.375, or you could type 3 slash 8. That would get you the same thing. The second one is going to be 1.75. So I'll type 1.75 followed by enter. So that gives me the inner diameter and the outer diameter. I still need my cross-sectional curve. So I'll come back to my circle, but instead of doing the uh, center and the radius, I'm going to look at my other options. Look, there's one for diameter. If I click on that, it will actually let me snap from one side to the other side of that circle thereby creating a third circle. So I'm going to, just for clarity purposes, I'm going to hide this for just a second so you guys can see the geometry here. So I have the outer diameter at 1.75, the inner diameter at, one, uh, at 3 eighths of an inch, 0.375, and I have this circle that's going in between those two. Next thing I need to do is do a Rotate 3D. I'll go up to Transform, Rotate 3D. And I'm going to fold that one so that it's up in the third dimension like that. Now it's time to do our sweep. So I could, in this scenario, do a sweep 2 and select this and that as my sweep rails. It's really unnecessary because it's symmetrical. So instead, I could pick either one and do a sweep one. So let me go into surface, sweep one rail. I'll pick the inside one, my cross-sectional curve. I'll press Enter, and one more Enter. And that then creates the little donut on the end. There is, by the way, a tool to create a torus, which is the other word for a donut. Somehow, for me, I like calling it a donut. but. Uh, so you could create it that way. And so in this scenario, it would ask you for the center. It would ask you for uh, the diameter. This would be point, uh, 0.375. And it would ask you for, oh, it's asking for the outer diameter, sorry. I don't use this very often. 1.75. And it would ask for the second radius would be... Uh, Oh, I didn't switch it to diameter. That was my mistake. Um, but anyway, you get the idea. So you could create it that way as well. You end up with the same shape. Let me go ahead and I'm going to turn back on that rod here. Now, if we look at the rod, and I could switch into shaded mode so you can see this a little bit better here, you can see that it intersects nicely there, but it also sticks out of this end, which isn't very clean. I'd like to trim off those pieces. So for me, it's a little bit easier to switch from shaded into ghosted. And the difference between shaded and ghosted is that ghosted lets us see inside just a little bit. We can still see what's on the outside, but we have a little bit more uh, ability to see what's happening on the inside. So let me use the donut as a trim. And I'll pick the trim command here, type trim, or go to edit and then trim. And then I'll trim off this and this which cleans it up on that end. Though technically speaking, if I really wanted it to be clean, I would trim back to there. Now I'll go ahead and press Enter to finish. And so there, it's nicely trimmed. At this point, I need to stand it up. So I'll take this whole little spire here. I'm going to do Rotate 3D. So it'll be Transform, or Rotate 3D. Snap right there to the center, and I will fold that one up like that. So this little piece goes right in the center of that, which happens to be, this is set up on a one foot square, so it would be at the coordinates 6, 6. So I could take this and I could move it from its center right here, and I could go to 6, 6 and there it would be right at the center. 
Uh, technically, I think my, yeah, my these pieces need to be moved up just slightly. So let me take all of those. I'm going to type move or go to uh, transform and then move. It's going to be a vertical move by uh, a quarter of an inch, like that. I could double check this by looking in the front view here. Yep, all of that lines up nicely. And so now when I get back here, once again I have kind of a nasty little intersection. I'd like to trim that off as well. So I'll take this tube here and we'll go ahead and type trim or select trim and I'll trim off. Oop. So I'm going to have to trim with both of these. So let me take here and here and I'll type trim. And there we go. Now I'm able to actually do my trim. If I look inside here, there are some little remnants. I'm not overly worried about those remnants, but you could go in and clean those up as well if you wanted to. All right, looks good. I'll go ahead and press Enter to finish the trim command. And there it is as its overall object. The last thing I need to do is I need to create the sheet of glass. That sheet of glass is going to be right at the center here, so I'll go and just use a rectangular box. I'll snap right to the center. Let me actually just turn on center snap. I could type in, come on, there it is. Or I could type in 6, 6 to get there. This is going to be 6 feet tall and 4 feet wide, so it would be at 4 feet comma 6 feet. And my thickness is going to be negative uh, 0.5 inches. And that then gives me the sheet of glass. It looks like I created it too tall, so let me move it vertically. And I still might have done it wrong. Yep, you would think I could get it right, right? Let me move this up by 0.25. And there it is, right in between. It should be right in between those two buttons, like that. So I need a little 3 8 rod that comes off of the end here. So I'll go back. I'm just going to do it with my um, cylinder this time. We'll start right there. Now in this scenario, it wants to create it vertically. So I'm going to switch and do it in this side view. Or I guess this would be the front view. I'll snap to perpendicular here. And that's then caused the orientation to be correct. And then I'll go ahead and type in 6 feet. Oops, should have been negative 6 feet. Well, I'll do it again anyway. So I was having trouble. I picked the point here but it only wanted to let me do it in the vertical direction. So I just switch over into my view. I look at the front view, make my snap in the front view there. Then I can come back to the perspective view and type, this would be negative 6 inches. How about negative 6 feet instead? It's one of those days. There we go. And it would be negative 6 feet that time. There we go. And we create that right there. Last thing I'll do is stand this up. So I'll take the whole thing and I'll go into Rotate 3D. I'm going to use my glass sheet as its guide. And we'll stand it up. And there it is. Okay, so the key today is working through those sweeps and understanding those sweeps. The, the, in step 14, uh, I'd like you to go ahead and assign some basic materials to this object. So we've got some kind of glass and some kind of metal. So once again, to do that, we'll open the V-Ray Asset Editor like this. We're going to look in the side drawer, the left side, for our materials. We're going to go into glass. 
I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I'm going to do the the coat the uh, <sighs> the glass coated blue so that hopefully we can see it. There we go. I'm going to drag it over there. I'm going to select my object. I'm going to right click on the material and say apply material to selection. It's applied. Then I will select all of the metal here. We'll go back to the V-Ray Asset Editor. This time we're looking for some kind of metal. <coughs> now there are clearly lots of uh, choices here. I'm trying to pick something that's going to show up. I'm going to do use this dark gray because it'll hopefully show up a little bit better. So I'll go ahead and drag that one over. And then I will right click on it and say apply material to selection. And so now I have the two materials assigned. Remember to create the rendering. We had a few other things to do. We're going to go into the settings. And here under the environment, we're going to change the background from its, uh, from its black to its white. Um, I had that as uh, 255, 252, and 250, I think. No, that's the wrong spectrum. This was 250, 252, and 255. There we go. Should have been in the blue. OK, and so I have that one set. That gives me a little bit of background. I need that infinite plane for my rendering. So I'll go ahead and close the asset editor for right now. I'm going to create the V-Ray infinite plane right there. That creates the infinite plane. My object is a little bit low for it, so I might need to take it and move it vertically, just so we can see the whole thing. There it is. So I have my object. I have my infinite plane. I need a little light. I'll use that box to help me create the directional light. There's the box. We'll create the V-Ray directional light right here. I'm going to snap from one corner to the other corner, and then go ahead and delete the box. So now that light is shining down on my objects. That's good. So at this point, we can go ahead and do uh, a test render and see what happens. I'm going to go ahead and click on the little teapot, which will open up the render window. And we'll let it process, but it'll give us a nice little uh, image here. And so again, my, my goal in using the blue was to be able to see the glass a little bit easier. If you pick clear, you're not going to see the glass very much. So pick the blue glass as you start to create it. OK, so I'm going to let you guys work through it today. This is a lot of steps. It's a lot to get through. Uh, but at the same time, it's a good practice to kind of get used to. You can see where this would be beneficial to building your chair as one of the skills that I want you to have. Um, so I'll let you work through that. When you're done, you'll save this rendering using the little Save button, and then you'll go ahead and post that to the course website. Do save your 3D file, your Rhino file. So just go to, up to File and then Save. This will save a Rhino um, 3D model file, 3DM. Save that on your flash drive because we will use it next class. We'll continue to work with it. OK? Any questions? No? All right. I'll turn you guys loose.